happy Easter. We're happy that you're joining us for this service. We're going to start with the worship of the church home called Jesus Christ is Risen Today.
Very impressed. You guys are rocking up here. I was thinking you're going like, to do like kiss and do the whole thing. Do guitars together on the B, my B. Sorry. They were great, huh? Fantastic. Praise God. Good morning, Glory Day. This is the day that the Lord has made, so we come together to rejoice and be glad in it. It's a little more traditional, but it still kind of works. I say Christ is risen, and you say Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Let's try that together. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Fantastic. You are absolutely right, church. I want to welcome on behalf of this people called Gloria Day, but the welcome really wouldn't be complete unless we do that together. So I'm, I'm going to invite you to stand up, maybe even walk across the aisle, shake a, shake a hand, say hello to somebody. All right, so maybe it's your first time here. Sort of the flow of, of our, our second service, our contemporary service, a little different than if you grew up traditional worship like I did. And so you, some of the theory is that we're just not ready to go into prayer right away or, or not ready to listen to the message. So it's kind of truncated the opposite direction because our life's crazy and busy. And sometimes we go so fast, like my, my watch even says, you ever had the Apple watch where it says time to breathe? Sometimes we forget to breathe deeply. So that's a part of how we, as we ease ourselves into prayer, it's sort of our habit. So I invite you to breathe in fully, breathe in, and then exhale fully. And this time when you breathe in, remember that the, the, every time we say the Holy Spirit, you can always translate both either the Old Testament or New Testament, the holy breath of God. So breathe in God's holy breath, breathe in. And then as you exhale, imagine the holy breath, the Holy Spirit of God cleansing you and making you ready for a place of peace and grace and maybe even prayer. All right. Jojo, you look ready, man. You're amped and with the great guitars and bass. I'm happy to be here. You're happy to be here. Man, I thought dad jokes were cheesy. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. No, 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 no. You don't get away with that. High five. Bring it. All right. <laughs> yeah, crazy old dad jokes are good, too. Morning. All right, oops, I gotta go over here to see the words. Let's go straight to the word. I love this. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here, he has risen. It's like, where else would these ladies go, right? She's, they, so, they watched him die. They followed Joseph of Arimathea and uh, Nicodemus. They knew where he was. Of course they were going there. But isn't this just what our God does? He turns our worldly wisdom upside down. And if we admit it, which I have a hard time doing sometimes, we're a lot more like these ladies than we'd like to think. Because we look for the living among the dead, don't we? No perfect job or perfect relationship will ever give us perfect peace and love. No 401k will ever give us perfect security. No new possession will ever give us perfect, everlasting joy. we got to face it. We look for the living among the dead, but God turns everything upside down. And when we listen to his word, he leads us to the right place. And he shows up as he shows up today. So how about one last hoppy breath? Let it go in. Let it all the way out and snuggle into your space wherever you are, here or home. Safe 
in the presence of our Father and Jesus, the risen Lord. As we enter the throne room, and we'll start with confessing that we do have a tendency to look to the world and to look at the things that really are dead for our peace and our joy and our comfort. Forgive us. We need your help. Holy Spirit, open our hearts and our eyes to see who you are, where true life is. It's with Jesus, who's alive right now as we sit here. And he's on his way back, where every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we thank you for your many blessings in our life, lives, and we lift up our loved ones, Santo, Marilyn, John, Doris, the Merrick family, Barb, Sarah, and Robert. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for Shirley, Denise, Michael, Kathy, Catherine, Santos, Shirley, Mary Lou, and Don. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for Brian Frank to fully emerge and come back to those who love him. We also pray for Jamie and Rob and Denise, Mary, Nicole, and Megan. Lord, in your mercy. We lift up Daryl and Rich, Rich, Ruth, Lupe, Dennis, Rose, VT, Holly, and Mary. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for Valerie, Isabel, Chris, August, Tony, Deb, Jan, Sally, and Dave. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray for Anne, Estelle, Glenn, Brenda, and Michael. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our homebound, Judith, Rudy, Maxine, Mike, and Trudy. Lord, in your mercy. We lift up our grieving father, the Russell family, for Melissa Russell, Hanson family at the death of Gordon, and Marilyn Bergmark family. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray for our church leaders and all of our community churches. We pray for the world, those involved in the Key Bridge accident, the Ukraine, Gaza, and Haiti. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we raise praise and thanksgiving for college acceptance letters, for Betsy and all she does to give us a great worship and a place to live for J.E. And we also pray for, thank you for clarity. Lord, in your mercy. And all God's people say, Amen. Now we move from a time of prayer to a, a sacramental time, which is just an ancient word that means holy and special. We remember, remember the night in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed. He took bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. They had supper with one another because it was Passover. They being Jews, that's what Jews do at Passover. And a part of the Passover meal in the end is sharing a cup of wine. But Jesus brings a whole new meaning to that. Again, after that supper, he took a cup, he gave thanks, and he gave it for all of them to drink and said, drink of it all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. It's shed for you, for all people, for the forgiveness of sins. And he said, do this for the remembrance of me. Let us pray boldly as our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Glory Day has open communion. Say, all are welcome. 
And whether you, this is your very first time being here, praise God, welcome, glad you're here. Or if you've been here many times, everyone's welcome to come and receive. This meal is not about getting, having your stuff right or ready. This meal is about that we all come a little broken or empty or just not quite right. And so if that's where you are, you are you're the first person that should come. And because it's for the forgiveness and the restoration and the making us one again. So as we come forward today, um, you'll be offered a wafer. You can either dip that into the red wine or a cup just like this that's on the baptismal font between the servers. A striped cup will have clear grape juice. Either drip into the wine that's in the center of the large blue chalice or the striped cup. Possibly there's somebody today that would prefer gluten-free. We have that available in the small cup and bowl combination. We just ask that if you're gluten-free is your preference, that you pick up the way for yourself and then dip it into either side of the, the split cup, the red wine or the clear grape juice before you eat. And return to the, your seats using the outside aisle. Some may have already picked up a communion kit where, and they can commune themselves right where they are. And then for our friends that are worshiping with us online, um, remember that the center of this meal is this promise. This is the body and blood of Christ given and shed for you. Now, will we get things ready for you in this moment of quiet? Don't just let it be unintentional quiet. Use it at a time where you're interacting with God spiritually in your mind, soul, and heart and saying, come Lord Jesus, come.
now for a couple of announcements. Um, one, I just want to say thanks to the people that provided the breakfast in between services today. If you participated in that, put your hands together and say thanks, huh? Awesome. <laughs> Praise God. Next, our next parents' night out, which we've been doing like once a month for the past few months, is April 19th from 5.30 to 8.30. The cost is $10 per kid. If you have, uh, that's probably considerably lower than the going rate these days. So not only do we take care of your kid, but we're going to have a bouncy house and all that fun stuff that your babysitters can't do. So it um, should be awesome and lively and fun. And if you have a friend that you know or you have a grandchild or um, somebody, take advantage of this opportunity and invite them. On April, Christian, our April Christian Action Collection will be for pads this, this month. For a list of items needed, you can check at the welcome desk where the coffee and donuts are served. And then just uh, want to welcome any first-time guests today. Know that we don't believe that you showed up on accident. Our prayer team has prayed for you all week, and so we're just rejoiced that you heard the call from God. And whether you are aware of it or not, that you're just here. And we rejoice in that, and God rejoices that you're here. But we also prepared for that. We have a small little gift for you at the welcome table where the coffee is. And we'd be happy to give that to you and send you home with that. Just a way of just reminding that, that God was a part of our worship today and that God loves you dearly, dearly. So much so that that's what Good Friday and Easter are all about. It's just showing you how much God loved. And now our worship continues with some awesome bell ringing. You, lay, you uh, folks ready? Bob, you're outnumbered, man. But you're in good company. <laughs> Let her rip. <laughs>
Fantastic. Way to go. Um, God's word comes to us this day from the Gospel of Mark, the 16th chapter. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought, brought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus' body. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They'd been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us and for the entrance of the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He's been raised. He's not here. Look, there's the place that they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he's going ahead of you to Galilee. And there you'll see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The Gospel of the Lord. Shall we pray? Lord, in this crazy world, there's much to fear. The news reminds us of it every day. And a part of our fears also are of us and our relationships. Because all of us in varying ways come a little broken, just not quite right. And we need your grace. And we need your forgiveness. And as you said, take up your cross and follow me. It's also the call for us to not just be forgiven, but to forgive others. All this we pray in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. I'm realizing as I look in the mirror, as I step on a scale, as well as I look at some of you who I taught son, uh, confirmation, that I'm getting old. <laughs> And, and I realize as I look back on my life that there's some things that some of you won't quite get, but some others will. When I was young, they had this, this amazing technological device that was called a blackboard. <laughs> and, uh, and literally, it was just a hunk of slate. A and um, you, you would write with chalk on the blackboard. And th they had this amazing other technological device called an eraser. It was just a foam thing or like a felt and you wiped clean. Amazing technology for the day. Now it's not anything like that. Now we have boards that like downstairs, we, they aren't black, but they're green. And now it also has evolved in the levels of, there's whiteboards and, you, and thou dost not ever keep Sharpie on the tray in front of the whiteboard, right? It should be one of the eighth command, 18th commandments or something. And then even for now, which I, I feel like I was always born too early, I love, raise your hand of the kids, of you, you in a classroom where they have a smart board. Yeah, well, just about every one of those kids. And, and, and how wonderful that that is a way to, for your teachers to be able to teach you in ways where I just had 2D. You're almost like in 3 or 4D where you can even be taken to places your teacher can talk about, well, you know, the pyramids, and they can like show you the pyramids and then do a flyover. I would have loved that. But... When I grew up, we had blackboards. And from blackboards, there's this phrase called a clean slate. Now, older ones were ready to jump on that. Some younger people were like, I, I've heard that phrase, but I have no idea what it means. Well, blackboards were made out of material called slate. It was, it's a rock that can be cleaved flat, and, and literally it was very helpful. You just, and then they hang it on the wall and put a border around it. And that's how teachers would teach so that everybody would be in the same place and they could see the outline of what the talk would be for the day. I want to use that analogy a little bit of a blank slate because I think that's what Easter's all about. Is that through Jesus' death and his resurrection that God takes care of and makes a clean slate for every human. From Jesus' day 
on into eternity after none of us is even here, that Jesus offers forgiveness. And to say if we were to write all of our errors and things that people have done to us, we're any place where we're broken or we feel dirty or we feel wrong or incomplete, is if we were to write them all on the board through Easter, all of that's wiped clean and we have a clean slate. And from that clean slate, God wants to write two words on that slate, that you and I are forgiven. And that you and I are also called to also forgive others. We said that in the meal just a little bit ago in the sacrament, right? Right after we remembered the words of institution, those words that were said at Jesus' last supper, we said, our Father who art in heaven, and we continued on and we said, forgive us our as we forgive others the trespasses against us. Jesus' death and resurrection remove the power of Luther said 500 years ago, the powers of sin, death, and the devil. All that's wiped clean. We have a clean and fresh slate anytime we recall on God's forgiveness. But Jesus, as he carries the cross and wins our salvation on Golgotha, also calls us to not just be forgiven, but to go and forgive as well. Since we're talking about old school things, I want to first start to talk about forgiven and a story about Mrs. Fullerton. Mrs. Fullerton, she was like an old school teacher. I don't think she could even teach anymore in this day and age because she, she was good and she was fair, but she was also harsh. And some of it, it was all logical, but I don't think she, you'd get away with some of her teaching methods in this day and age. For example, if, if you were caught chewing gum in Mrs. Fullerton's class, she would make you take your gum out of your mouth and she wouldn't ask you to put it into the trash bin. She would ask you to put it where? Some of you old people. On your nose. <laughs> Do you think that would fly this day and age? Probably not. You might even get fired for this, or at least you get a reprimand. But it was such a healthy tool because at the end of the year, sure as shooting, it wasn't just the, the custodians cleaning out underneath the desk because if you're in Mrs. Fullerton's class, you're having fun with your friends, you're chewing gum, and hey, do you want to stick a gum? Yeah, I do. And then you got into Mrs. Fullerton's class, you're like, oh, oh, I'll just kind of put it <laughs> under there. And, then, and, and some of you old school teachers kind of might remember that you might have had to clean under those desks. Ew, gross. So you might go... Or you might just like so caught up in thinking about the cute girl that gave you a cute look in, in between classes and you're like just chewing your gum, not even thinking about you're in Mrs. Fullerton's class and all of a sudden you start blowing your gum or start cracking it and like, and she just looks at you. And then she does this. And you're like, oh. And you have that thing stuck on there. And not only that, but she would have you a hundred times right on the blackboard, the slate board. I will not chew gum in class. 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 Your hand would start to cramp after a while. You're like, why do I have to do this? Why is she the old battle axe? I didn't say that. Why, why does she do that stuff? Why? It wasn't so much the gum on your nose which just was a reminder. That's just rude and disrespectful. In fact, it's, her, her methods were way less harsh than they are in Singapore. My daughter lived in Singapore about five years ago. It's illegal to chew gum anywhere in Singapore. You might end up in jail or you'll at least get a harsh fine. So if you fi find to Singapore, leave the gum behind. <laughs> Mrs. Fullerton just knows on the gum and the right the thing on the board. But at the end... She would then take that felt eraser and she'd wipe off all of your errors. And then the board would be clean. And then she'd say, where are your errors? Where's the evidence of your crime? They're gone, Mrs. Fullerton. You, you did wipe them all off. Yes, I want you to learn from this. It's about respect, but it's also about understanding forgiveness. I forgive you. It's in the past. Leave it there, but also learn from it. 
you are a different F word that sometimes is used in school now. You are forgiven. I still remember this. It's like 45 years ago because she taught me what respect is all about and she taught me what forgiveness is all about, which I think in a lot of ways is a lost art form in this world in which we live. Is it not, church? And maybe the world's looking for us to show how that happens. So God wipes the slate of our life clean. Now, some of you come with baggage. You're like, gosh, I hope the pastor doesn't bag on me and get all into like sin and guilt and, you know, judgment stuff. I don't need to. You already know it. There's parts of you that just weigh down the things that are in the past. That's what Easter's all about. Leave it in the past. Why is the rear view in a car, rear view mirror in a car much smaller than the front windshield? Because that's the level of importance. What's in the future is way more important than what's in the past and what's behind you. Leave it in the past. Move into a new reality with a clean slate. So not only are we called, are forgiven, but we're also called to forgive. Forgive us our trespasses. We forgive others as they have trespassed or sinned or whatever they've done against us. Ooh, the hard part. I like the first part. God, I need forgiveness. Forgive others? Lord, you don't know what they've done to me. In fact, Lord, you know that I'm Scandinavian and I really like holding grudges against others. Anybody else with me? Man, I can hold grudges. I was taught by the professional grudge holders. Some of you have seen the news this past week. And stay with me when I talk about what it is to forgive and the hard work of it. Is the part of what forgiveness is about that something's broken or wrong and something needs to be corrected. There's a bridge called the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Any of you ever been over it? Nobody's ever lived on the East Coast, so you have no idea how important this bridge is. You, you all saw the news, right? The boat. And please stop any of the conspiracy theory that some kind of immigrants crashed it in there to shut down a bridge. Ridiculous, right? In fact, some of those people that went under were actually immigrants. Some of the people who are working on fixing that bridge for the next generation were immigrants. Ridiculous. Silly. Let that nonsense go. Let's get back to the bridge. This is an important bridge. If you're trying to understand how important it is, is imagine if somehow a mile and a half long stretch were just, just blown up from a tornado or some kind of... Well, earthquakes wouldn't happen in, in Illinois, but imagine if just a mile and a half of the Kennedy and the Eisenhower were obliterated. How would traffic go in Chicago if that were to happen? Exactly. In fact, this is a major artery, 695, which is the beltway of Baltimore, that really literally in some ways connects Washington, D.C., and if you go far enough all the way up to Boston... This is that important. And it's within the Baltimore Harbor section, which actually the better harbor on the East Coast is not New York, even though New York's a far bigger city, but is Baltimore. And along that stretch, along the Patapsco River, which the, F, the key bridge, as we used to call it when I lived out in Baltimore, is if you go a little further as you go into the inner harbor of Baltimore, is Fort McHenry where Francis Scott Key penned our national anthem. For the land of the free and the... Yeah. And brave people are going to have to put that thing together again. Because the Patapsco River there is 50 feet deep. And there's a whole lot of that bridge that's down there. And the barges will not be able to go in and out if we don't clear all that out. And we're talking tons of metal that's down there. People are going to risk their lives to put this back together so that our country can get flowing again. This is going to be hard work. Now, why it's personal to me? Because I lived out there for five and a half years. That's why I understand all of this. 
And see, you see why it's so personal is that we'd load up uh, every other month or so when the weather was good, we'd load up our kids in the back of the van and we'd go across the Key Bridge, we'd go down to Annapolis and then we'd ride the Bay Bridge and we'd go to the ocean. And you go from that bridge to this bridge that takes you out, basically out into the water. And you can just see the ocean and water for everywhere. Imagine if aliens came to this planet. What would they call it? They wouldn't call it Earth. What would they call it? They'd probably call it sea because there's about 70% water as there is to Earth. And water is so important to everything. It moves everything. It's what makes... <laughs> and you may say, that's all out... That's about a thousand miles from here. It doesn't matter. We have so much rail. Even when we take the rail into downtown, it keeps going from there and goes all the way to the East Coast. And then it goes out to harbors like Baltimore and out to the world. You see, my friends, we are all interconnected. That's why when things are broken and wrong, we need to reconnect them because what happens there also happens here. We know this from three years, four years ago. What happens in China happens in Downers Grove, does it not? We are all interconnected. And so when something's broken or not right, like forgiveness, we need to work on it to make it right so that we can clean the slate and make it right again. Now, all this thought of that bridge going under and just how it just, so many of my friends are just imagine just how everything got changed by just one little bridge. And I thought of just the bridge as an analogy, and I thought of in 1985, it was a year after the police. And if you're young, just ask your parents about how awesome the police were. One of the greatest trio bands of all time. All apologies to some of the other groups that are out there, but amazing and they had broken up and then sting went off on his own and his first album was so great that he actually even had a grammy a nomination for his first album the the dream of the blue turtles and and one of the most famous song of that that album was called fortress around your heart which i think tying the bri the, the bridge analogy to forgiveness sting gets it right the lyrics go like this under the ruins of a walled city crumbling towers and beams of yellow light. No flags of truce, no cries of pity. The siege guns have been pounding through the night. How many of you have had a loved one or a co-worker or a classmate where the siege guns have been pounding through the night in the same way that the siege guns that won your freedom because it was in jeopardy in 1812 from Fort McHenry when our star stangled banner still waved but it was tenuous at that moment because of battles and fights. Continuing. It took a day to build the city. We walked through the steets in the afternoon. As I returned across the fields I'd known, I recognized the walls that I once laid. Any walls that you put up between someone? Coworker? Family member? Neighbor? had to stop in my tracks for fear of walking on the mines I laid. You ever like laid proverbial landmines for somebody else and then you stepped on a boom? I wanted, I wanted Carl to step on that one, not, not me to get it. And lastly, and if I built this fortress around your heart and circled you in trenches and barbed wire, let me build a bridge for I cannot fill the chasm and let me set the battlements on fire. It's that last part that I think we need to do. And I think the, the, the world is waiting for us as church to do this because all I see is them arming themselves even more. Literally, some people literally trying, like during this, this time of politics have gotten insane. The, 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 the selling of firearms has gone whew, as well as just how people behave. If you notice that people just are like so awful. We just jump so quickly to setting up landmines and to shooting each other, sometimes even literally. 
The world's waiting for us to start building bridges and stop laying landmines because that's God's desire. <laughs> Notice, God has wiped all of it away, yours, and has called us to wipe away others because you are forgiven and you are called to forgive. How many of you this past year are in desperate need of forgiveness? Notice my hand's up. Anyone want to join me? Feel free. Raise it high if you're... Mine's as high as I can get. I need it. But even more importantly, there's others that need our forgiveness. Just like that bridge on the Patapsco River that connects everything to everything. It's going to cost a lot. It's going to take time. It might even be dangerous. But you and I are called not to be line, mine layers. But we're called to be people who wipe the slate clean. And even when it gets really bad, are called to build bridges. That's what being forgiven and being forgivers is all about. Shall we pray? Oh Lord, this, this that we witnessed you do in this past week, this night in which you've been trained, this night where we celebrate, or the, the week that we celebrated you marking, marking, marching triumphantly into the city on Palm Sunday, and yet we turn on you within a week. Oh, was that a metaphor for me and maybe some others that are here today? So quickly we turn when we're disappointed that it didn't happen the way we wanted it to be. And yet, now from this vantage point, from Easter, we see how much you forgive. We see your cross and, and your call. We hear your call to take up your cross and follow me. The cost, the cost that you paid for us and the cost that you call us as we go out and be bridge builders and peacemakers. Lead us on, O King Eternal. We pray it in Jesus' name and God's people said, Amen. All right, church, get up on your feet. Let's, let's do some singing.
Malachi, how are you doing? Hey, Dave, I saw Lutherans like moving and swaying to music. Is that okay? All right. Thumbs up. All right. Good. So and now a blessing. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, church, go in peace, serve the Lord, and be a blessing to others. All right, church, how we live this stuff out is like we say glory day. Go out there and give them heaven. Have a blessed week.